Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the York Consortium for Conservation and Craftsmanship and to the first of our new winter series of Second Tuesday Talks. My name is Martin Stancliffe, and I'm chairman of the consortium and of its sister charitable foundation. We launched these Second Tuesday Talks following the success of our webinar, Conservation and Craft Myths, which was held online in June last year in place of our planned AGM. Uh, we're subsequently glad to have attracted a wide audience to the events of both the summer and the winter series of talks. And as well as our members, we're delighted to welcome many non-members again tonight. I hope that our regular participants will forgive me for yet again saying just a few words about the consortium by way of introduction. The consortium was established over 20 years ago in recognition of York's central role as a hub for conservation and craft skills within the heritage sector. We've built upon this to emphasize the close integration between craftspeople and conservators and to provide a point of focus for both practitioners and those interested in supporting our heritage. The foundation's annual bursary scheme has also flourished and we've awarded over 250 bursaries to date to support the development of craft and conservation skills. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome our speakers for this evening, Kasha Howard and Linda Lockett. Kasha has, uh, is engagement man manager for the Landmark Trust, and she organizes the activities for a range of programs, including Open Days and National Lottery Heritage Fund funded projects, most recently at Llewyn Kellyn in Wales and Winsford Cottage Hospital in Devon, both of which were RICS award-winning projects. Currently in its development phase, Kasher is researching and delivering a range of events at Calverley Old Hall in order to research and develop a programme of training and engagement opportunities, and tonight she will be telling us about those. Linda Lockett is an architect well known to me, uh, as for several years she worked closely with me in my York office. She's an ex-SPAB scholar and has a wide experience of historic building repair and conservation works. She now works full time for Landmark, responsible for overseeing both projects and maintenance of their properties in the north of England and Scotland. She consequently travels an enormous amount and is at the moment, and is at the moment on site with a project at Fairburn Tower, north of Inverness. So I'm not sure even exactly where she is at this minute, but she's joining us by Zoom. Anyway, it's great to have you both with us. Before we hear Kasha and Linda speak, there are just one or two uh, housekeeping matters. Um, first of all, we need to say that it, we're not anticipating any um, connection issues, but if we do encounter any technical uh, worries, please bear with us. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation and indeed afterwards. You can do this by clicking on the Q&A icon, which should appear at the bottom of your screen when you move your cursor there. We're anticipating finishing at around eight o'clock, but if there are outstanding questions then, uh, for those that want to stay with us, we'll continue for a few extra minutes to answer these, but probably not beyond 8.15. And now for reviving Calverley Old Hall. Before we begin, I ought to confess that I used to be a trustee of the Landmark Trust and so played uh, some kind of part in trying to devise a future for Calverley. Indeed, I first saw Calverley in the mid 1980s when Landmark asked me to go and look at it for them in my capacity as a York based architect. And I've been interested in its challenging future ever since but I'm going to leave it to Kasha and to Linda to pick up the story. So over to Kasha. Thank you very much, Martin. And I have a confession to make as well. I've got a bit of a cold. So if, if I have to break to cough, then uh, apologies in advance. Right, I will share my screen. Excellent. So this is our Carvely Old Hall. Um, for those who, who aren't familiar with it and where it is, um, it is actually to the west of Leeds um, and um, is actually closer to Bradford city centre than it is to Leeds city centre. So it's always kind of had a bit of a 
kind of toe in both waters as it as it were and actually a lot of the later wealth of the village itself is down to um, the uh, uh, the industrialists um, who lived in Bradford as opposed to to Leeds itself so it's nicely located to be able to capture both uh, communities from both cities um, but this is what it looks like now um, and uh, what you're looking at is the southeast uh, facing um, sort of collection. Um, and actually, this is the, the view, obviously, lower down that you would get from the Woodall Road, which runs through Carvley Village. Um, and um, the other thing I need to explain is that um, if anyone does ever go to Carvley, um, you will very, very quickly be told that it is pronounced Carvley and not Calvley, despite its spelling. Um, and that's because it comes from uh, the Old English uh, Calf Lee, um, which is, has now later become uh, Carverley. Um, I made that mistake early on and, and was told off. So I'm very, very careful now to say Carverley. Um, so this is, this is how the building looks now um, in its present condition. Um, oh, hang on a second. My, there we go computer gone to sleep. Um, a very, very brief history of what makes Carvely so special. Now, there is a lot more information on our website, so I'll run through this very, very quickly because this could actually take a whole talk in itself. Um, but basically, we know from records that um, in the 12th century, a family appeared in uh, Carvely called uh, the Scots. Um, and by the early 1300s, they'd actually taken on the name of the village. So they'd become the Carvely family and they had built themselves a whole house, a small manor house on the site. And the remains of that building um, are still visible today, kind of um, almost fossilized within the within the, the rest of the, the, the building that developed over time. Um, but they are still there. And um, that whole process of, of discovering that evolution is very much part of um, uh, uh, the, the, the building archaeology that's ongoing at the minute. Um, but the Carvely family, um, as the Lords of the Manor, um, existed in, in Carvely for 500 years. And we know that there are a set of papers in the British Library, um, the family papers, which, which basically are a log of, of their sort of day to day uh, living. Now, we'd hope to be able to access those papers by now, but with obviously the recent pandemic, that's been impossible. Um, but we hope to be able to do that soon with the help of an expert who can, who can actually help us de decipher the contents of, of this stash of exciting papers that exist. Um, the Carvely family itself were a very colourful family, um, and there are lots of them. Um, the heirs were all uh, very helpfully either Williams or Walters, which actually makes tracing their family, um, you know, the, the, the individuals in the family quite difficult because you soon get very confused between which William was which and which Walters was which. But there are a few that stand out in their history. Uh, we know that Sir Walter of the 1300s was a pioneer of the iron industry and likely to have sort of developed the family's initial wealth. But by all accounts, he was quite lawless and often found himself in trouble. Um, his son, Walter, um, he was very much interested in prudent marriages for his children. Um, and by doing so, probably increased uh, the family's wealth um, again. Um, by 1480, we have another Walter who stands out because he uh, was the, the member of the family who invested a huge amount of money in the building of the Great Hall and the chapel on the site as well. In the 1520s, um, another Walter was knighted by Henry VIII and fought against the Scottish. Um, and then William, his son, served as High Sheriff of Yorkshire. His son, Walter, with his 17 children, he added another part of the building, the lodging block in the 1580s. Um, the family uh, remained Catholic um, after the, uh, the Reformation. And, and actually, this was the beginning of the downfall of the family because they were heavily fined at this point. Um, and some of the problems that that, that um, caused led to sort of well-documented um, ill health and ill mental health in the family as well. And by 1605, this led to um, another Walter and the infamous murder of his two children. Um, 
there's lots more information about that particular incident on our on our website, which our Carol, which our historian Caroline has researched. Um, it was the surviving son, the third son, Henry, who was kind of left to rebuild a family, which by that point were probably in tatters um, with their kind of, uh, uh, you know, having been appeared on the national stage um, for such, uh, you know, horrendous events. Um, but he managed to keep going. And it was his son, again, another Henry, who helped to revive the family's fortunes. But really by that time, um, they'd pretty much done with Carvley as a residence. They were looking forwards, they were looking onwards, they wanted somewhere better to live effectively. And so um, they moved to, again, via a, a, a prudent marriage, they moved to Eshalt Hall, which is just down the road from Carvley. It's now the Yorkshire Water site. The Yorkshire Water used to be there, called a sort of big training centre. And then from there, within a few years, um, they moved to Wallington Hall in Northumberland. And that was the end of the Carvley family because that particular Walter had no heirs. So that's when our Carvley family came to an end. And after that, they sold the estate in the 1750s to the Thornhill family. It was divided up. Uh, by the 1860s, there were 11 households living on the site, which was much expanded by that point. Over the years, they'd added um, you know, stables and barns and, and additional little buildings that, that became occupied. Um, and so it became a, a, a vibrant, happy site lived in by um, all sorts of local people, uh, farm workers, folks who, who worked in the local mills. Um, there were stonemasons living there. And a lot of these um, lovely people are documented in the local censuses. And that's something that we've been researching uh, recently um, with the help of the local community and will continue to do so. Um, by the 19, late 1970s, though, the site was in a pretty horrific condition. There'd been a large fire in one of the barns and the Thornhill family decided to sell it up. And that's when it came to Landmark's attention um, because it's going to be all, the, all those little cottages that, that had evolved on site were going to be sold off in separate lots. And so Landmark was able to buy it. I'm not sure for how much, but um, probably for, for, for a song um, and was able to buy it as one whole. Um, kind of uh, a group of buildings, always with the intention of bringing it back to something representative of its late medieval, early modern heyday. But that has been an awfully long road um, that we embarked upon. I don't think anyone who, who, who was part of that originally would have envisaged it taking quite so long to get to this point. But that's where we are now. And it's very exciting that we are. So this is this is the exterior of the building again um, that uh, southeast view. So we have the chapel there on the left hand side, um, in between with that lovely big Tudor window. That's the uh, the remaining solar block, and then to the right of that, to the right of that little porch that was added on, is the exterior of the great hall. And so that's basically the, the 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 kind of the medieval early modern core of the building except for a couple of kind of later victorian additions which, which still exist the little porches and that other little um sort of building that was a kitchen um just at the bottom uh right hand side that's um outlined in orange but the rest of it is is medieval and early modern um uh, fabric um uh, which is incredibly exciting um but all those ancillary buildings, all the old barns and things like that are, are, are long gone. And, and actually we're quite surrounded by other housing now. And some of that other housing is, is quite modern housing and not in brilliant condition either. Um, but all the local residents, um, you know, have been deeply worried about the condition of, of this building for many years um, and, and rightly so. And, and so they're, they're all kind of very much um, excited by the prospect of finally getting around to doing something with it as we are, which is lovely. Um, so inside, so this is the inside of the solar. So this was the original hall. This was this was the original first floor hall or part of it that the Carvley family built. So we can still see some of that original timber framing in these walls. Um, uh, and you'll see the note on the side there that, that the person that most people now um, relate to this particular part of building is Herbert Pratt the Milkman because he was the very last resident of this part of the, the building and there are many local residents in Carvley who still remember knocking on the door uh, for a pint of milk because they they run out and couldn't wait until the next delivery. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but that's how, this is how it looks now, very much derelict, very much in poor condition with, with, a, with a very, very fragile reef structure above. Um, this is the Great Hall um, with its huge, enormous fireplace, beautiful hammered beam roof, um, which you can just see the bottom of there in the, in, in the picture, the, uh, um, uh, the first floor. Um, remains of the first floor there actually hide the, the structure of the Hammond Beam Roof, but it is there and it is absolutely wonderful. Um, and the Great Hall was actually converted um, into three cottages later on. And so that bit on the right hand side, that fireplace that you just see emerging into the picture is part of one of those cottage fireplaces. So those conversions into cottages were not shoddy bits of work. They were actually quite significant and substantial bits of building that, that were added inside. Um, and so removing them has been a really difficult decision to make. And there was some removal of, of that fabric done um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but um, part of that, one of those dividing walls remains on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, that's a dividing wall as well. Um, so all of those need to be sort of considered in the plans as we move forward. Um, excitingly, um, in our most recent investigations that have, have been taking place over the summer months, we've discovered some wall paintings. Now, these are in part of the building that has always been known as Mrs. Bartle's Cottage, because she was one of the very last residents who still lived at Carvey Old Hall. Uh, I think she died, um, I think, 2007, 2007. Um, and we had no idea that these wall paintings were here. In fact, Mrs. Bartle and her family had no idea that these wall paintings were there. But there were a couple of clues. There were sort of fragments of paint on some of the timbers and, and we just had a bit of a hunch. And so we, we set to very carefully um, and um, discovered these uh, fantastic paintings. And I'll, I'll leave Linda to, to sort of dwell on them in, in a little bit more detail, but they obviously will, will be, you know, have made uh, a huge impression on us and on the scheme that we're proposing to, to proceed with. Um, but they are very exciting. They are in the, the grotesque uh, style, which just goes to show that the Carvey family were, were, were wealthy and wanted to show off their education. Um, and, and this was very much a kind of a room where they could have, they could have done that, um, meant for private guests rather than for kind of public display. Um, and so they were designed to impress. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Linda now, who's going to tell us a little bit more about these exciting plans that we have up our sleeve. Thank you, Kasia. Um, <clears throat> very interesting introduction, and um, I'll take it from here. Now, Kasia's working my slides for me, so excuse any pauses while we wait for the next one to come up. Now, what, we're, what are we going to do with this building and how are we going to repair it? When Sir John Smith took the building over in the 1980s, he did a fair amount of work. Unfortunately, we still had a few live tenants living in the property. Um, one was Mrs Bartle. And so we were fairly limited in what areas we could get access to. Sir John Smith repaired the roof of the Great Hall. He repaired the chapel and restored its interior and also took the lodging block, the late 16th century block, and converted it into a landmark uh, holiday cottage. So um, since, since the mid 80s, uh, we've had a small landmark holiday cottage which accommodates five people, but um, um, three quarters of the site has been left derelict. Um, Sir John Smith did apply for planning permission to, to strip out quite a lot and convert it back into um, its medieval hall form, but unfortunately uh, consent wasn't granted. Um, at that point, it was kind of left in the state that it was at the point where the application was made. Um, and over the years, there were various attempts to try and find um, new use for the building. It's an incredibly complex building on many levels, um, not easy to interlink all the spaces, though they would have been interlinked originally. Um, and, you know, Martin was brought in in the early days to look at it. And then 
um, we had a couple of other attempts at, at looking at it. And I did a, a, a survey of it in 2015 and it became very apparent that the roof was at a point where make do and mend would no longer suffice, particularly for the for the solar roof, which you can see here, and all the damp patches on the timber that we've got, um, threatening um, the survival of some of the wonderful carved brackets we had. It became quite urgent to find something to do with the building um, because it seemed sensible to convert it at the same time as doing a major uh, fabric restoration. And um, so that's, that's where we got to at the moment and um, uh, what we're what we need to do is to find a good use for it so I'll tell you about that in the minute um, but we're also looking at repairing the fabric so the main fabric repair issues left are the roof we've got a lot of walls to restore windows are, are rotten um, and um, you know, we've got a lot of fine medieval carpentry there that needs repaired. So there's a huge, huge um, fabric repair job to do on this building before we even start thinking about what to do with it next. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what we're re proposing is a mixed use. So we'll create a um, holiday let um, a community space and a flat. Externally, we're proposing only to make minor changes. Um, we'll not be restoring the original appearance of the building. We think it's important that all the changes that have taken place over the past 700 years remain legible on the outside of the building. Internally, we'll be making some marked changes that will allow significant features to take preference and the history of the building to be more easily understood, as well as making the building comfortable place to stay. Next slide, please. Right, well, what we had to do to try and establish exactly what we were, we were going to do here was to create a philosophy of repair. And it, it was a gathering of uh, various um, people within the landmark, our historian, director, um, and to, to look at what we actually wanted to try and achieve. So our philosophy of repair, we aim to preserve, reveal all surviving fabric dating from before 1665 which includes the Great Hall, the Solar Chapel, Parlour Block and Lodging Block. Um, and this would be prioritising this 1665 form. Um, this, is, this is the point where the Carvelys have kind of reached the final development of the hall. This is when it's still in the family use and they've done all the work to it that, uh, that they needed to do before they, they left. Um, we want to preserve the internal these internal volumes and the relationship of key spaces of this exceptionally high status survival, especially the late 15th century volumes of the Great Hall, Solar and Chapel, allocating these spaces to landmark accommodation for 10 people. Cleared where relevant of later insertions to reveal the exceptional surviving roof structure. The third item is that the landmark will respect the grain of the medieval use of the, in the former hierarchy and functions of the shared and private areas. For example, the solar range as bedrooms and the great hall as communal spaces. We thought we needed to remain open-minded on whether a contemporary or historical approach was taken to the scheme as a whole, but we wanted to avoid explicit restoration when evidence of primary form is absent. So there's a, there's a great reflection here of what we did at Astley Castle. So we're looking at, at um, making an intervention which doesn't distract from the original fabric, but, but speaks of of uh, a 21st century intervention. The 
compromised external setting of the old hall and erratic fenestration means that landmark accommodation's main gaze will be inwards. The scheme will seek to make this a virtue. So we haven't got a great outlook. We're in the middle of a housing estate, but we do have a fantastic interior. And this landmark is about looking inwards and, and, and seeing what we've got internally. The parlour and lodging block will be allocated as an AST and public use. Um, we, need, we, need, we need a use that complements the landmark and we can't use the entire building. It's, it's much too big for us. So the existing, the existing landmark will be turned into a flat on the first floor for um, uh, rent. And um, the ground floor will be turned over to a community space, um, which we hope will be will be much appreciated by the local residents and will help help us try to um, um, bring the locals into the building. Next slide, please. Two things the Landmark Trust are doing with this project, which we haven't done with previous ones, is firstly sustainability we're trying to make this this building much more sustainable um, by uh, insulating it um, and for those of you who've been to landmarks before draft proofing it which will be a huge benefit um, we're also looking at um, putting in uh, sustainable heating systems in the form of pv panels on the which will be on the hidden roof slopes and a ground source heat pump but that's not all. We're looking at um, showers which reduce water consumption and um, ways of heating, uh, underfloor heating, which, which are low temperature and, and will give off a very gentle heat to the, to the hall. And um, this, this kind of gentle heat is always better for old buildings because we don't get that kind of um, creak and groan that goes with expansion and contraction as things get hot and cold. Alongside sustainability, we're looking at accessibility. We have many buildings in our portfolio which are very difficult for people with any kind of disability to, to move around. Um, even those who, who just have difficulty walking or walk with a stick. Um, but this is one where we'd like to really look at it properly and make it it as fully accessible as we can to um, independent wheelchair users, those with um, hearing difficulties and visual impairments. Um, we are aiming to reach the Visit England standard for these so that, um, so that those guests who'd like to come are aware of exactly what, what they're going to get when they get here. So that's a big, big, uh, big thing for us in this project is to really get a much wider group of guests coming. Next slide, please. Right, so onto, onto the scheme that we've got for restoring the landmark. Now, uh, we scratched our heads for many years over this and eventually decided we weren't going to solve it internally. So we decided to hold a architectural competition. So in 2017, we advertised it and we had uh, 71, um, 71 expressions of interest. And out of those 71, we chose 11 architects to go forward and produce a scheme for us. And we got a, a wonderful variety of um, inventive ideas, but the, the scheme that, that really, um, really sort of spark the imaginations of our, um, our panellists was uh, a scheme produced by Cowper Griffiths architect, Architects. We thought that, that this, this scheme kind of encapsulated Landmark's ideals. It, it really sort of, um, it highlighted the existing building. Um, the new, new elements were elegant but restrained. And they came up with a with a layout which worked really well with that existing building and really satisfied all elements of our uh, philosophy of repair. So what we'll be doing here on the left hand side of your screen, you can see the chapel. 
uh, that chapel will remain as uh, a, com a, a place of contemplation. Um, it, it won't have a, a specific use, but uh, landmarkers will have access to it, and it will be a space which we hope will also be used by the community. Um, moving across to the middle, you see the, the solar block. Um, the ground floor will be used as bedrooms and the first floor as a living room. So there is a kind of reflection um, of the original use of the solar as the kind of family, main family living quarters. Then we move through into the Great Hall. Um, we're not going to take down this major dividing wall. We're going to leave that there because it was part of that um, development works done by the Carvely family. And we'll be reflecting the original cross passage, which would have been at the um, left hand side of the, the hall as you're looking at it uh, against the solar block. Um, and um, this, this area will become the sort of circulation space for the building with the staircase going up to a gallery level. And then on the right hand side there, you can see the great hall, which we'll be using as a kitchen and dining area again reflecting that medieval use. Next slide please. Right so I'll take you on a, a little tour of more detail. So this this is this is the um, the end of the hall which we're going to be using as a stair hall. Um, and you can see on that top slide the bottom of the principal spear truss. Uh, visible through through what was a bedroom ceiling in one of the the cottages. On the ground floor is um, the uh, 1950s fireplace that was installed and um, that junct supposed with the uh, original fireplace we've we've found which you can just see where the pass has been taken from the wall and there's a, a small section of fireplace there, a large, a large fireplace that will be revealed as part of the works. And then we've got our wonderful five light window uh, looking out onto the garden from that cottage. Uh, next slide, please. Now the intention is to take the Victorian partitions out of there, open that space up, open up the, the fireplace and create a staircase. And the side of that staircase will will kind of mimic a screen's passage. So we'll be we'll be forming that kind of screen's passage space, which will link the original two medieval doors that we've we've discovered at either end. And then that 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 artist's impression from Cal Griffiths uh, will also give you a view through into the hall. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, this the the cross passage takes you into the great hall, the medieval hall, and here you can see the link between the two in this spear truss, which which is currently hidden behind uh, a partition wall. You also hear see here the wonderful large medieval fireplace. We've got the roof structure. Um, with its men medieval hammer beams that was restored by Sir John Spith back in the 80s. Uh, next slide, please. So this will be our kitchen living space. Um, you can see that dividing wall, which will have been opened up at either end and reduced slightly at the top, but will still be visible with all its various um, uh, changes to the use to that wall visible, those fireplaces will still be visible and we'll simply be lime washing those walls so that the, the outline of all the previous changes will be visible. On the lower levels of the wall, we're, we're creating a, a set of panelling which will have shutters in it to provide privacy and um, uh, help control light levels and this panelling will be insulated, um, help try and get some insulation into those lower walls and we'll also take all our services so we're not having to, to um, 
cut into the walls at all to put our sockets and light fittings in. Um, we'll be designing a uh, modern um, accessible kitchen, uh, which will be designed for not just um, um, the use of able-bodied people, but those who are in wheelchairs and with sight and hearing difficulties. Would you put the next slide up please, Kasha? Moving through into the solar, this is accessible on both levels from that cross passage um, circulation area I showed earlier. We have um, a, a really rich tapestry of work that's been carried out on this building over the time. If you look on the left, we see the original um, early 13th century fireplace. Uh, with its it, its, mon its monumental sizes, with its its great um, heavy heavy brackets and lintel. Um, below that, there's there's a fireplace that was added at a later date. Um, and this this kind of hierarchy with the the family's living quarters on the first floor, and below that there would have been the, uh, the stores for grain and um, probably a brewery and uh, buttery and all the kind of um, storage and amenity spaces required by, by the hall. Um, so this first floor will be converted into, its, uh, into a living space. And you can see the kind of level of detail we've got here with the, the wonderful um, brackets. Uh, which which support those roof trusses and um, the lovely window we've got at the um, at the south end of the building, which will let much needed light into that sitting room area. Next slide, slide, please. So this is the artist's impression of that first floor space, much cosier than than what we were looking at before. We'll be keeping the fire open, putting a stove in it. Um, and this will become our cosy living room. Next, please. Um, moving on to the lodging block, um, this, this is the area which we're going to convert into a landmark, um, a, a, a community space, and I'll let uh, Kasha tell you a bit more about that. But this this um, this lodging block is dated to the end of the 16th century, and um, we've got a wonderful um, timber roof which has actually been dated by dendrochronology, um, and um, we we discovered that just about every timber in that roof comes from the same tree, which is quite amazing. It must have been a huge tree. We can move on to the next slide, please. So this is this is what the conversion hopefully will look like. Um, we'll be keeping that wonderful exposed timber um, timber ceiling and the fireplace, and this will become an, a flexible meeting room and and space for people to use for for other community uses. Um, training. We've got ideas for training in here and. Um, yes, I'll leave Kasha to tell you about that in more detail. Next slide, please. Right. Um, the one thing I haven't got a slide in, which I should probably have done, was a bit more about the wall paintings room. Um, we discovered that last year and um, it was it was a bit of a surprise. We opened up in two or three areas um, not expecting to find a great deal and in every every um, opening up we did we found a, another bit of significant wall painting um, in um, April this year we we got consent to remove all the um, 20th century lath and plaster from from the walls and we uncovered three walls of complete Tudor wall paintings which Although there are a few examples down south, there's nothing that we know of in the north of England. Um, a few little scraps here and there, but nothing so complete. So for us, those wall paintings are a major find and something that uh, is changing the way we're thinking about that building and the use of it. Um, those uh, chambers where the 
uh, wall paintings were found. They're Tudor, Tudor chambers um, uh, were allocated for bedroom use and still are. Um, we're as yet uncertain how we're going to conserve the wall paintings and present them to landmarkers and uh, the community and other interested parties. But I think ideally we would like them to be on permanent display. Um, but we're, we're still doing our research there, so watch this space. Um, next. Oh, sorry, I'll keep with this slide. Back, back one. Thank you. I haven't explained what we're doing here. Um, last year, we were lucky enough to get some money from um, Historic England from their funds from the Cultural Recovery Fund. With this, we were able to uh, do quite a lot of repair work. We replaced all the gutters around the building and, and made sure that the, the uh, water was running off the building successfully. We did quite a lot of pointing work. We repaired the chapel window, which had been badly damaged. And here you can see Keith Barley um, carefully restoring um, the bits of broken glass on site. Um, that's, that's been a huge benefit to the project and um, another stitch in time. Um, on to the next slide, please. Um, now, uh, we're currently, we've applied for um, some more cultural recovery fund for this year. And the intention is, if we get that money, is to start re-roofing those areas which weren't tackled by Sir John Smith in the 1980s, the most perilous of which is the roof over the wall paintings, which is what you see here. Um, We've got uh, very loose slates. We've got um, gaps opening up um, in the lead work along the edges of this roof and um, what we know to be water soluble wall paintings below them. So if we get this money, we'll be starting in November. We'll be putting a temporary roof over this block and the solar block, removing the roof and tiles and repairing those the, the roof structure before uh, replacing the tiles again. Um, this will be a, a, a real relief for, to us if we get it because uh, it's exceedingly worrying now that we found those wall paintings, um, whether we're going to be able to, to keep them in good condition. And the best way to do that is to keep the water out. So it, it's, it's a real benefit to us. Now, um, the work is subject to a, uh, we're, we're, we've, we've done quite a bit of fundraising for this, and I think Cash has got a bit, bit more on that later in, in the uh, talk. So what I'll do is I'll pass back to Kasha now um, to, to continue with her information on the engagement. Thank you, Linda. Um, so yes, one of the things um, that for me makes this project uh, particularly exciting is its proximity to a local community. Um, quite often um, our uh, landmark uh, projects can be quite remote um, or uh, difficult to, to access, which makes them fantastic as holiday lets, um, because when you get there, you know, you have the place to yourself in, in you know, beautiful rural settings. Um, but the great thing about Carvey Old Hall is that, as I mentioned earlier, it's in between Leeds and Bradford. Um, it's on the, um, you know, you can get to it by bus or by train. Um, and from there, you can explore um, the cities or the countryside as you wish. Um, but the fact that it sits so closely within uh, such a, you know, a very local community, but then a much bigger and broader community as well, is brilliant for um, engaging with people. And so, we knew very early on that this would make a fantastic candidate for a National Lottery Heritage funded project, not the easiest thing to say. Um, and so we applied um, early on um, for the first round um, to enable some uh, development phase uh, works to proceed and that funding has um, enabled a lot of that building archaeology, um, the early investigation um, that revealed the wall paintings, 
um, and obviously all the development work that's been done by the um, project architects, structural engineers, etc. Um, but it's also enabled a huge chunk of public activity to, to start already. Um, we discovered that we were successful with, with this first chunk of money um, literally just before the first lockdown. So it, it was March 2020. So it was a very, very brief moment of cheer before we realised that actually we wouldn't be able to do anything. <laughs> so we had to kind of sit and wait for the best part of a year, really, which was incredibly frustrating for us because we just wanted to, to get on with stuff. And a few bits and pieces were able to go ahead last winter, but certainly the big kind of uh, public activities and workshops and things like that um, couldn't go ahead but it gave us time to to sit and think um, even more deeply about what it is that we wanted to do and you know one of the most important things that we want to do with this project is to uh, really work with a whole new community of people and identify new audiences who perhaps you know don't feel as, as though they can um, uh, uh, kind of engage with our, our heritage um, or haven't done so in the past um, or folks who for whom there are other barriers say transport or language barriers and so we really you know we knew that this was the perfect project to be able to tackle some of those long-running issues about engagement with our, our heritage. Um, we wanted to um, find out about other local organizations in the area um, and identify some really strong partnerships and start to work with them so that we're not doing this in isolation because for any project to have continuity and longevity it's important that you bring other people into a project like this and share that excitement and um, uh, you know share the opportunities that, that they can offer as well. Um, we wanted to uh, explore lots of different types of activities on site. Um, so be that workshops, open days, events, training events, um, things aimed at, at, at people from, from different communities and ages. And of course, um, all importantly, um, with everything that, that we've run, we've wanted to gather feedback from people as well. So they're, they're all the things that you know, we're really excited about from, from that, part of that, that part of the project. So um, we're, we've literally just come to the end or coming to the very end of this first phase, this development phase of activities. Um, and we've had a really busy summer on site and we've been able to do not quite every single activity that we'd hoped for. Some things have proved quite difficult um, to, to achieve. Um, certainly access to some of the indoor spaces has been, has been difficult. We very much had to work with the consent of, of um, other organisations that have signed up to, to join activities or, or with individuals to see whether people are comfortable with working indoors, those, sort, those sorts of things have been really, really important. But nevertheless, it's been an incredibly active summer. So um, the sorts of things that, that we have delivered and that we want to continue to deliver and we're just kind of, um, you know, sifting through all the, the feedback are things like heritage craft training, which is a really, really important strand of what we want to do. It's a fantastic opportunity. We know that there are shortages um, uh, for, and, and, and a lack of opportunities for, for giving people proper experience of, of training um, on site. So we want to be part, just part of one of the organisations that try, that's trying to address that. Um, we also want to encourage lots of visits by community groups and schools. Um, so, you know, um, whether they're uh, kind of from, um, you know, his, historical groups or, or creative groups, um, there's something in this building that everyone can engage with. It's got such a fascinating story and history um, behind it, um, as well as the kind of the the sort of the solid heritage building craft training. There's also lots of other um, kind of the, the other associated crafts that we can explore as part of this project. So that might be weaving. Of course, you know, we, we are in a place where there's a fantastic weaving history and heritage, uh, furniture making, uh, which lends itself beautifully to the sort of the greenwood style of furniture making and, and the sort of the lovely uh, uh, sort of medieval style furniture. Uh, gardening, uh, looking after that, 
that small um, green space that we have around the building, but nevertheless, it lends itself to certain projects like a knock garden, for example, which we can do with the local community. A local history project is really important as well, and it's something that um, has been really successful during, the, during this first development phase, even though we haven't been able to access local archives, that's something we can do later. But um, you know, being just being able to do things online um, has has given us um, a lot of excitement. Um, and we've discovered so much about those later residents who lived there, and the the colourful lives that sometimes rival rival the colourful life of the Carvely family itself. Um, so there's lots of work there to do to to, to develop on that. Um, we uh, training videos, which have been really successful at other projects that we've done, other lottery funded projects that we've done. Um, so rather than just um, you know delivering things on site, making sure that 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 training that we can do is actually accessible to a much wider audience that might not be able to visit um, uh, in person. Um, digital visualization and audio description that very much goes again with accessibility, making sure that. Um, whatever we we do is accessible um, for a range of people um, who may only be able to listen and absorb information by listening um, for example so again that's something that that we're planning on doing with the local history group is taking some of the research they've done about the village um, and some of the lovely uh, trails that, that they've developed and actually turning them into audio described um, trails um, and, and really kind of placing Carvery Old Hall in that wider history of the village. So making sure that, you know, that original medieval manor is, is reflected in, in its scale and in its importance um, locally and, and actually within the county as well. Um, study days and public open days, um, making sure that we can kind of target very specific areas of interest but then wider specific of interest where people just want to come along and have fun so for example the, the latest open days that we did with reenactors was absolutely brilliant because um you know it, it was lively it was noisy it had flags flying in the wind and and people coming along for all sorts of reasons young and old and and it was a great great day out for everybody um and linking in with other local events as well um so uh Carvely is actually an incredibly vibrant community um and in a normal year they would have lots of village events going on from um kind of garage sales through to open gardens so we want to make sure that we can uh, tie in with those um moving forwards um and the lodging block which will become a really important legacy of the of, of the project making sure that there's always a space there available for groups who are visiting um for people who want to have business meetings you know in a, in a gorgeous historic setting um uh through to people who want to run workshops creative workshops there and of course we will use it as an organization as well um for training that we want to do and, and also for our open days as well so there's a huge amount of potential there of things that we could do that photograph on the right hand side by the way was was one of the things we managed to do last winter and it was one of the local opera groups who couldn't perform their christmas offering live um and so they asked whether cinderella and her her not so ugly sisters ugly in spirit um uh, could come along and actually uh, use Carvely Old Hall, use the lodging block of Cinderella's house so of course we said yes that would be fine because we had no guests in because we were in lockdown but they did a fantastic job of filming in there and that's just the kind of thing that you know is really nice thing to do um and um so this is just sort of the this sort of focus on some of the craft skills training that we we did um this summer um it, it, it's a brilliant building because there's just so many different things that, that we can do um, and you know we know that we can offer fantastic opportunities in, in stone masonry, carpentry, plastering, decorative arts um, and even bricklaying as well because uh, we know that there's there's a shortage of that skill even though it's not you know there's not that much brickwork at Carvey Old Hall there are elements of, of additional brick buildings um, and so it is something that that is is kind of relevant to the, to the building we know that there's a shortage of really good skilled uh, bricklayers in the area so that's something that we can support as well um, so there's there's the there's the sort of the heritage you know solidly heritage craft skills as well but then there's also the transferable skills that we can look at as well so uh, general building maintenance garden maintenance repairs looking at um, you know working with um, 
uh, uh, M&E as well and, and just look at it really sort of understanding or, or, or giving students the opportunity to understand how how you can sort of retrofit a historic building safely um, whilst um, looking after that historic fabric properly. Um, and but again, going back to the point about audiences, we really because there are some fantastic opportunities for for people who want to train in heritage craft skills now in the north with historic england's wonderful hamish ogston um funded program which offers people's you know three brilliant routes into um heritage craft skills training but we were very aware that um actually there, there are folks for whom even that opportunity may well still be frightening um, and may well still seem out of reach and um, the legacy of one of our other heritage uh, funded projects, Lewin Kellen in Wales, is um, that there we ran uh, just some away days uh, for uh, local refugees from Swansea and Newport who came and spent some time with us um, at various stages on site. And, and we just did some away days with, with you know, carpentry, with dry stone walling and things like that. And it was chatting to, to them and to the folks from the agencies who, who work with them, where I suddenly realised that there are people here whose lives have been turned around, who've come to this country quite often with good, solid skills. Um, and we're missing them. You know, we're not um, focusing on on inviting them and encouraging them to um, look at the heritage sector as an opportunity for a really, really good uh, career. Um, and so that's something that we want to try and address through the work that we do at, at Carverley. And so we're going to be running um, uh, six week pre-apprenticeship employment academies um, where we will be uh, inviting uh, members of the refugee community um, to come and spend some time with us on site um, and um, you know develop the confidence develop their English language skills work up to being able to get their um, CSCS card test um, and, and just get that get that feel for who we are you know the, the the heritage sector is just such a wonderful sector to work in we all know that, that that's that's why we're here doing what we do um, and, and I think it could be a really welcoming place for them. And the days that we ran in the summer um, absolutely gladdened my heart. Um, and I think everyone who was involved in those days really saw the potential in, in many of the people who came along on, the, on those days. Um, and so that's something that we'll be particularly focusing on um, over um, certainly the first part of, of the project next year. Funding, you know, fingers crossed that we get the funding for that. Um, but we will also be making those opportunities open open to, to, to everyone else as well. So there'll be a range of different options where people can kind of step in. But it's very much this sort of pre-apprenticeship that for, for those folks who, who, who just need that extra little kind of, you know, pat on the back and gentle push and encouragement for whatever reason um, and have never perhaps, you know, realised that there's, there's opportunities in the heritage sector. Um, so yeah we want to reach out to them as much as possible um so the next steps for our project obviously just going back to this uh, the devil is always in the detail and there's still an awful lot to figure out which we're going to be doing over the next few weeks with kind of the next layer of, of kind of meetings with people to, to understand what it is that we're proposing and make sure that we've got all that all that detail right um but the next steps in the project um uh, the, so we're likely to be splitting the project into two phases. Um, so as Linda mentioned, we've we've applied for some extra CRF money. So if that goes ahead, we'll effectively sort of break break the project in, into two. Um, the overall project costs we're looking at are about four point seven million, uh, which is an eye watering amount of money. Um, but you know we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think it was a a, a, a building that was worthy and it was money well spent and with all the public engagement that we can do as well um, we've we launched our public fundraising appeal earlier on this year and it it has been we were a bit worried because obviously it's a building that we've owned for a long long time um, but we've worked really hard to get that message across to people and to tell them you know tell them honestly why we are where we are and um, what we plan to do now and everyone has responded so generously it's one of been one of the most kind of you know um well supported 
uh, sort of project appeals. And, and we've had, you know, uh, 1,700 um, supporters so far, individuals who've donated money, which is just incredible. Um, we'll continue fundraising through the winter, um, including this major bid to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which will go in at the end of November, and that's for 1.6 million. Um, and then there'll be a, a, a fresh public fundraising appeal um, in late October, early November, which will focus on the wall paintings discovery. So at that point, those of you who are perhaps particularly interested in those wall paintings, which are so beautiful and so tantalizing, there'll be a lot more information released about those, uh, the, those paintings um, to coincide with this extra fundraising push that we're going to be doing. So do look out for that um, because we're just holding off partly because we're still gathering all the research together um, and um, and partly because we want to just just kind of surprise everyone with all the you know amazing photographs and and wonderful news that we've got about them so um, so thank you for supporting this project um, just by being here tonight and choosing to log in you are doing that because it shows that you know um, the, the project is is intriguing people and enticing people and 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 people are, are spending their evening listening to, to Linda and I telling you about it, which is really great. Um, we are still receiving donations. Um, and if you would like to stay in touch with the project, which I hope you do, I hope I hope there's something in this project that makes you want to get involved in some way or another, um, then please sign up for our e-newsletter, which goes out, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe at the minute once a month, but it'll probably be more like once every two or three months, um, once you know this, this big sort of act, activity over the summer has finished. Um, but the email address there is at the bottom. So if you just drop us an email and say you'd like to sign up, then we can pop you on the list, um, and then we'll keep you in touch with everything that's happening. So um, yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to us. Um, and yeah, I think we're ready to take questions and things like that now. So I'll stop screen sharing. Um, there we go. Thank you, Kasia, and thank you, Linda. Um, that's brilliant. I knew I knew it would make a brilliant story, and um, and so it has. Uh, probably you can't see me. Um, uh, so um, uh, you've already answered a lot of the questions that I had up my sleeve, um, uh, but uh, um, it has reached um, past eight o'clock. And so we are slightly running out of time uh, for questions. So perhaps, uh, Kasia and Linda, when you're answering, you can, you can keep them as brief as you can. I mean, um, of course, I respond to your appeal. Um, to staying in touch and staying interested. I mean, I hope you feel that the consortium itself as an organization is something which might um, be of a help and assistance to Dad to see Keith Barley, a, a member of our um, consortium uh, already involved in um, uh, doing the glass. So that's all very good news. Um, while we were talking, while you were talking, uh, Linda mentioned an AST. And just to clarify what an AST, it means an assured short term tenancy so that um, uh, by by renting um, uh, the, the property of the flat, um, you're not actually get, gaining a right to stay there forever and ever if you stay too long. Effectively, I, I, as I understand it, I think that's right. That's correct. Yeah. Um, um, we've had some very good questions and just while they're sort of coming in, and I mean all of you who are now uh, listening or, or taking part, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to write any questions that you have. Um, just while that's happening, just very quickly, you didn't mention archaeology at all. Have you had archaeologists involved in the project as a whole? And if so, who were they and, and how did that work? Well, we, we have had archaeologists and they've, they've spent an entire two years crawling over the building. We've had uh, Jonathan Clark of SA, FAS archaeologists in York and um, they've done an amazing job at a uh, a statement of significance where they've gone through the entire building and looked at every significant element and you can imagine in a place like this there are a lot of them and we've graded it and every time we go there we find something new and I think we will continue to do so throughout this project it's fascinating and 
everything we find changes the history and <laughs> we, we have to keep writing, rewriting it. So yes, by the end of it, I hope we'll have a really good understanding of that building. Great, thank you. Um, now, obviously craftsmanship and, and uh, craft skills um, has been very much in the, uh, your mind, and of course is very much the central purpose of this organization. Um, we've had a very well phrased question from Lisa McIntyre. Does the Landmark Trust have its own craftspeople or does it bring in contractors? Have you been able to incorporate craft training because you have your own team? Or is it something that you will require contractors to coordinate as part of their team? Do you want to answer this one, Kasia? Yeah, I can do. Um, so um, in house, we we have a furnishings team, which um, is very much kind of part of that kind of crafts um, uh, delivery. Um, but um, I guess what we're interested in here is is some of the more solidly building crafts. So um, we we don't have our own kind of in house crafts team. Um, on that side of things, uh, we always work with the main contractor for our projects. Um, and so that would be the case with Carverley. Um, and so the contractor will, will, will bring in skilled people. In terms of the training that we'll be delivering, um, we, we won't expect the contractor to be delivering the six week academy. We, we will actually work with um, uh, other sort of skilled craftspeople in, in the area. So we'll keep that kind of separate, but still on site and still do some of the kind of the real life opportunities um, with the contractor's blessing on, on site. So it'll be, it'll be sort of like a, a, a symbiotic relationship, but certainly for the, um, for the days that we delivered on summer, it, during the summer we worked with uh, Mark Wormersley to um, do the, uh, the plastering side of things. And that was absolutely brilliant. And he also did some homeowner days as well. So that's uh, um, a relationship we'll develop um, more in the future in terms of developing more, more courses or, or the academy with, with him. And then we also worked with Terence Lee, who's at, based out in Shropshire for the brickwork um, and um, a, a chap called Simon for, for carpentries um, out in Sunderland, I think it was. Um, so we will bring a, a, a pool of trainers in specifically to do that, but we would expect a symbiotic relationship with the contractor on that side of things. Well, that's good to hear because um, obviously we as an organisation have some some quite um, good and uh, um, experienced craftspeople as part of our membership who might be interested in, you know, seeing whether they can help in any particular kind of way. I yeah, mean, do get in touch with us. You know, there are some bricklayers who I can think of particularly just at the minute who, you know, might well be of use to you, um, perhaps slightly more local. Excellent. Um, uh, can you say something about the um, planning process? Um, did, the, uh, did the planners have anything of value to add to the design development as it went along? Yeah. We, we uh, negotiated, well, we, we talked to not just the planners, but um, the amenity societies at a very early stage. We had a couple of, couple of days where they were invited to come and look round and comment on what we were doing. And their, their comments were all taken on board because obviously there's an awful lot of very sensitive fabric in there. So by the time we put our planning application in, they were all aware of what we were doing and what our kind of philosophy was. So while it took a fair while to, to get the consents through, there were a lot of questions still to be answered um, about things like archeology span and um, uh, a lot of, we, we'd concentrated mainly on the building. So most of the questions that we received at the planning stage were about the exterior, the, the, um, the, archaeology in the ground itself, how we dealt with car parking and cycle parking and all that kind of kind of ancillary stuff like bins. Um, but good news is that yesterday we we received our written consent for the work. So uh, we now have uh, planning and listed building consent, which is a huge relief and been a lot of work for our architects. Great. Well, that's um, very good to know. I, I did wonder whether behind that question, which incidentally comes from James Grierson, uh, whether there were any issues 
to do with the sort of neighbours who were concerned about the change of use or the development of more um, people, you know, where are the cars going to park and is it going to produce a lot of noise and all that kind of thing. Was there any of that or were the, were the community very supportive? Well, we tried to keep them informed throughout the, the process. Um, and uh, we, had, we had a webinar with them for them um, when we submitted the planning application so that they were aware of, of what was happening. We took on a, a board a lot of the issues that they had with sort of noise relating to bin collection and, and car parking on the street, which was a problem for them. Um, so yes, we, we, we work quite closely with the community to make sure that we, we were doing the right thing for them and took their comments on board throughout the process. And I think Great. it's fair to say that the building as it, is, as, as it has been, it was attracting more and more vandalism. And, and obviously yeah. you don't want to be responsible for a building like that in the heart of the community because that vandalism then just spread. So, you know, the, the locals were, were really sweet during the lockdown. So obviously the whole, we didn't have landmarkers in, so it was completely unoccupied. And so um, they were very, very lovely in in terms of you know going out for their daily walks and actually walking past the building and alerting us to anything that looked wrong mm. um and so yeah there, there is this sense of you know ownership of their history um and wanting to make sure that the right thing is done by it which is really nice great um there's a technical question here um asking what the value of the partial insulation behind behind the panelling is and where would the heating elements radiators or the underfloor heating be um has, um, has the heating been modeled for condensation risk yes we've we've uh, got a very good services engineer and uh, we're working very closely to make sure that that we do have the right right kind of insulation and everything we're putting in this building is um, is breathable. So we've got um, a natural wood fibre insulation that's going into those walls and um, the panelling um, is, is natural timber, which is ventilated top and bottom. So throughout the whole structure, all the things we're adding is, is breathable fabric. Um, with regard to the question of the below ground, um, below ground uh, heating, we're, we're putting underfloor heating in all areas, but uh, um, a couple of the bedrooms where we'd like um, people to be able to control the heat a bit. So we've got, we've got radiators as well, supplementing that. The actual um, the heating system is going to be um, all the the gubbins that goes with it will be in a a, a little shed outside. Well, not a little shed; it is it's about the size of a of a single garage. But we're moved it out the building so as not to have too much pipe work and too many interventions with regard to all the uh, heat stores that are required for the ground source heat pump. Great. I mean, it's perhaps worth saying that th this idea of sort of passive heating for um, very low level background heating for a, a big stone massive, massive building like that um, is very good for combating um, condensation because you, 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 you effectively sort of um, can, can screen out cons um, yeah. uh, condensation uh, a, by doing that. A building becomes a storage heater, I think. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we've got just two or three more questions to go. Um, it is actually nearly quarter past. Um, are you happy to stay on and, um, you know, for a few more minutes yeah. and just take those last few final questions? Um, we've got one here about the refugees you're hoping to involve. Will you be providing ongoing support and mentoring for them? And how many do you anticipate that you might be able to cope with? really really important point that kind of ongoing support and mentoring and and yes you know one of the important things is that we don't kind of run a six-week academy and then just go oh see ya you know off you go but you know they those for whom there are um you know opportunities and, and pathways we will definitely support them through that you know that the um 
uh, the the uh, apprenticeship opportunities that that are out there, um, particularly the historic England one, um, you know, builds in a, 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 a huge amount of support for people. So, you know, it, we we would hope that one or two people might be able to progress onto that. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, we've we've again one of the bits of research that I'd, I'd like to do is is to actually chat to local businesses as well and just un understand what what the route is for people um you know a couple of conversations that i had with people have been really again really heartwarming people have said oh yeah you know we we have we have taken folks on and 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 they've they've been in a great place and 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 they've learned quickly and they've been really enthusiastic um and you know we would hope that we can be on that journey with them for for as long as possible um in order to support them and for those for whom the six week academy is is perhaps not not an option um then you know we'll have ongoing volunteering opportunities that people can um can dip in and out of and they can actually develop a a, a portfolio of work um so we can photograph what they do and we can mm. you know help them to, to to um kind of communicate what what they've been involved with um and so they come away with with a portfolio that that's perhaps representative of 18 months of engagement rather than just six weeks mm. um so it's very much the idea of of you know creating pathways that you know anyone who wants to can be involved in um, and in terms of numbers you know what we yes we'll have to be careful because in the end the spaces that that we're working with aren't that big so we'll, we will have the uh, the lodging block the great thing about this site is that the lodging block is a is a kind of a a, a ready space for us to be able to use for sort of the more classroomy side of things but then we can create the safe space outside as well for the for the more uh, for the things that we need to do outside as well and create some temporary structures and um, things like that great. should be very exciting. Great. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that sounds amazingly wonderful um, and, you know, hopeful. Um, maybe you'll come back um, and give us another webinar in, in 18 months or something and tell us how it's gone <laughs> and how many people you've managed to, to encourage and train. Um, just very quickly, a small, quick technical one from Keith Knight. Uh, who wants to know what type of glass Keith Barley was using um, in that window repair pro photo that you showed us? Um, to be honest, I can't remember. <laughs> we did we did match it up anyway. Um, the The thing about that window is that it was uh, it wasn't a medieval window. It was installed by Sir John Smith in the nineteen eighties. So we matched up with the um, we. I think it was probably an agricultural glass that we used in that one. Oh, it looked dreamier um, to me than the agricultural, yeah. but maybe not. We, we had a... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, uh, a question from Richard Lockett. Is the presentation of the building going to show something of the outbuildings that have been lost, i.e. how the hall worked? Um, we We can't really show where the outbuildings were because most of them are now covered up with the uh, 1950s housing. So uh, we've, we've kind of lost that. What we will be doing as part of this is creating a history album, which will, um, which will have all the details within that of the statement of significant, the research that's being done, and we'll, we'll kind of plot the development of the hall um, through the ages and just show show what has been lost over the years mm -hmm. um, from the from the greater estate because obviously it was it was far bigger than than just the hall. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we probably ought to wrap up at that point. Um, can I just ask when I can uh, when I can book to go and stay there? When's it <laughs> done by? We're we're hoping providing all the funding comes through when we'd like it to come through work work will start on site in the middle of next year we've then got an 18 month contract on site and um we'll we'll be starting our opening preparations in early 2024 so uh with any luck we'll be open for business in early summer 2024 Great. Well, that's something to look forward to. Well, thank you, both Kasia and Linda, for your absolutely fascinating talk. I knew it would be worth getting you. And um, uh, you've really fulfilled our 
dreams. Um, thank you all who've been watching and participating tonight, and I hope that you've all enjoyed tonight's talk as much as I have. Um, before I leave you, I'd love to take the opportunity to invite any non-members to join us as members. Uh, we welcome supporters as well as practitioner members, and you can sign up via our website where you will also be able to find more details about the benefits of membership. Um, we'll be taking a break next month to prepare for our spring series, but we hope that you can join us for our next talk, which is about lifeboats, the lifeboat station project by Jack Lowe, Jack's eight year mission to photograph 238 uh, RNLI lifeboat stations using a 19th century process on glass. So that will be Tuesday, the 9th of November, which doesn't sound uh, as though we're missing next month. Uh, it sounds as though it is next month. A link to register will be pasted in the chat, or you can visit it on our website. So that's it for tonight. Sorry if we've dragged on a little bit um, uh, long, but it was so interesting. Uh, thanks again to all our panelists, and thank you for watching, and good night. <laughs>